here. We've been at SNU for quite some time now. Her PhD um, was in Ontario and a joint project or joint uh, institution between Waterloo and La uh, Laurier University for Hydrology. And you're bringing that knowledge here to Halifax and you've been working on water issues, water security, really a whole range of topics related to water in regards to uh, geography and the weather. So very interdisciplinary expertise. And I'm very happy to have you here for the seminar and have you here at SNOOP for such time. And as well working in Western Africa, and that's huge, that region in Africa. So it's very nice to see that information brought here to see what's happening. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Linda. Thank you guys for coming on a Friday afternoon. It's nice that we have food. <laughs> um, this is going to be really informal. It may not even be your typical academic presentation. I'm not going to present statistics and data. And it, it really, this presentation is going to be about stories. I historically had never been involved in food security. In fact, just to tell you, here's my first story, and I haven't even gotten off of my title slide yet. The first story is, how on earth did I get involved in food security? I got a call from a colleague at Cape Breton University who's an agricultural scientist, soil scientist. And he had been involved in a project on indigenous vegetables in southwestern Nigeria. I'll talk about indigenous vegetables and underutilized vegetables in a minute. And he said that they had just had their, as anyone who gets national Canadian funding knows, you have a mid-year review. And the reviewers, midway through, they had traveled to southwestern Nigeria and found that the project they were doing on, on food security was deemed to be fantastic. But they were concerned about water security, which was not a part of their project at all. They said that, for, you know, and, and asking on the ground questions about, well, okay, so food security is being enhanced here, but what is the water security situation like? And they didn't know. They hadn't been, that wasn't a component of the project. They said uh, water security, I mean, it's, it's a very kind of high water use region, but it's also a rainforest, it's a monsoon season, water is quite abundant during the, the growing season. So they were talking about water quantity, they said, no, no, we're not interested in water security from the water quantity side, we're wondering what's happening to the water quality, is it being compromised in any way by um, the actions of the different agricultural activities and so on. So knowing that this was a very community-based sort of project, and I'll explain what that is all about in a few minutes, um, he called me and said, Kathy, would you be interested in going to Nigeria? That's before anything about what food security. How would you like to go to Nigeria? My first reaction was, what many of you might think is, Nigeria equals Boko Haram, abduction, kidnapping. I'm a geography professor. I had been working in West Africa for a decade already. I had been working in the Gambia and in Ghana. I had never been to Nigeria, but I still had the, oh my God, why would I land in Lagos? And why would I do that? And it's dangerous. And, and I'm hearing south, and I know Boko Haram is in the north, but still, this sounds a little bit uh, sketchy to me. I'm not sure. So my gut reaction was, mm, not so sure about it. And then as a, a real academic, as they started saying, oh, but it's right up your alley. Water monitoring, community, we, we need the community-based environmental monitoring network to do their thing. And you can take exactly what you've been doing in other places and, and work with farmers and women's groups. And, I, and, and so I was getting hooked really quick. So there, first story told. Let's just kind of situate ourselves. We're sitting here in the geography department. Nigeria is not one of the largest, not one of the smallest countries on the African continent. Zooming in, so you all should kind of be familiar generally where Nigeria is, and I'm focusing in on Nigeria first, and then if there is time, I'll start talking about the Gambia, which is this tiny, tiny little sliver of a country over here. Lagos um, is right here, it's on the coast. When you hear about all of this, oh, the horrors that are happening in the country, they tend to be in the north and east. And if we look at the scale, this uh, is it's 200 kilometers. So I felt um, pretty secure landing in Lagos. And we were traveling to Oshun province, O-S-U-N, but it's pronounced like ocean. 
So this is where we were traveling, and this was the region. This, by the way, this kind of area of Nigeria is kind of the breadbasket. It's their valley. It's where they grow vegetables. It's where people from Lagos will depart the city and travel north to buy their vegetables, to get their cheap bundles of bananas, much like we would travel to Mastown Market and go to the valley and travel to Kentville and go to Henniger's and buy our fruits. and So it's a very, very uh, well-known, established, fertile, growing region. So once we landed, I was, uh, or the, the project had been set in place, I was excited to go. Did a little bit of background research on some of the geographical characteristics of this country. This is an age structure diagram, typical developing country, typical African continental age structure diagram, meaning that if you look at the percentage of the population under 15 years old, male and female, there's a lot. There's a lot of children, a lot of children. And this was one of the concerns in this community or in these communities around water security is that anecdotally the reviewers and people in the community when they were asked what are your concerns generally above and beyond growing your food and having successful crop growth a lot of people were talking about concerns around abnormalities birth defects um, slow kind of educational levels and people were concerned about their children and it makes a lot of sense when you look at the fact that families are large and a large percentage of the population is under the age of 15. This is a, a cartogram which stretches or, or changes the shape and the size of what geographically, physically is on the ground to repre better represent a particular statistic. So on the left-hand side are, are the, the political boundaries of the conventional map projection, and on the right-hand side, we're looking at population. So Nigeria, remembering that it's this country here, swells in population. It's a very densely populated, highly populated, the most populous country on the continent. And so food security is, is an issue, certainly. Um, soils are generally quite... Um, Fertile, uh, fortunately, aridity is not as much of a concern, especially to the south where the food is grown. Um, but there is a lot of um, not only subsistence farming, but also agricultural productivity that's intended to uh, export. So this is a, a breadbasket of the continent, and certainly also locally for that, that individual nation. I have only a few slides that have text, and then there will be more stories as kind of the, the images will tell. Again, I said that, apologies for those of you who are here for a high level food security academic presentation, that may not be the case, so it's good, we're gonna look at some stories, but here are um, some context, some text that further kind of explains what food security is. Certainly the media, when, when talking about the African continent, puts a lot of focus on major famines, especially ones that have occurred in the eastern part of the continent. Uh, but the media has marked Africa as a continent of hunger. This is certainly not the case when you go to Nigeria. Um, food is abundant. But what the concern is around is as populations grow and as um, nutrients and soil are being overutilized and maybe overfarmed, and maybe there isn't as much sustainability in food production as there has been in the past. The importance of kind of looking at different at different vegetables and different types of um, uh, of food to produce is is increasingly something that people are interested in. If you look at uh, global statistics at the population of undernourished, which brings in not only the amount of food, but the quality of food that is being consumed, again, most of those that are, sh are kind of emerging as higher percentages of the population that are undernourished start really focusing on the African continent. Nigeria um, is one of the kind of green, less concerned countries, again, because you're in a region here that um, is, does have a monsoon season, does have a relatively stable growing season. If we move over to the Gambia, it's starting to move into that kind of yield color or cautionary color, 15 to 24 um, percent. And there are, are concerns that it won't take much for other parts of the continent to shift as climate changes, as growing <coughs> patterns change, as precipitation patterns are becoming a little bit more unpredictable and unreliable. But when we put all of this into a global hunger index, 
These are not perfect indices. There are flaws, um, as there would be with any index. Um, but certainly, again, as we would unfortunately expect, the African continent starts to show with serious and alarming rates of global hunger, again, mostly focused in the central and eastern Afri North African regions, um, but the context there is. So I think this might be the last slide with text, and then I'm going to get to those photos. The context here was to enhance food security in that ocean province, southwestern Nigeria, to to test methodologies as well to see whether they might be applied in other parts of the continent. So enhancing food security with the reintroduction of indigenous vegetables. So going back to that point of indigenous or underutilized vegetables. Before colonization, Nigerians in that part of, of the country used to grow different crops. So I kind of think about this as um, here in Nova Scotia, some people will pick dandelions or different things that the, other, the rest of us might think of as weeds, put them in their salad, flowers. Uh, I, I know I've, I've been to um, different people's homes and seen what they put in their salad and gone, can you really eat that? <laughs> I picked those for my rabbit, but really for me, is that something I would? So my perception around what is a normal to put in a salad, I'm using a salad as an example. For me, putting violets in my salad wouldn't be the first thing I would choose. I go to the grocery store, you know, I pick my romaine lettuce and, you know, some of you sitting in the room are thinking, what's wrong with her? I love to have dandelions in my salad. But perception is important when it comes to food. You might perceive that eating escargot is really disgusting and that might, your perception might be that that's my favorite thing to eat. Everyone has perceptions that typically comes along with your experience, your upbringing, what your parents fed you, and so on and so forth. All right, same story in Nigeria. Typically, it, if you went pre-colonization days, what was indigenous, what was normal to eat, what was normal to consume in a salad was very different than after the Europeans came, the British came and said, we really don't want you to grow this. We would like carrots and tomatoes and iceberg lettuce. So. They started to shift over their pattern. I'm simplifying this story. And so now when you go to Ocean Province, what's typically grown in a farmer's garden or a, a crop to, for even export would be things that we would be quite used to. Meat, now that's a different story. We're talking just vegetables. Meat, if we have time, we can talk about that. The kinds of meat that is consumed in Nigeria is very different than what we eat here. Anyway, so having said that, um, looking at reintroducing indigenous vegetables. Why? Couple of reasons. The idea being that these are crops that are more um, susceptible to periods of drought, that are more uh, drought tolerant, that typically naturally would have grown there, are more suitable to the, the precipitation patterns and the soil characteristics that wouldn't require as, mi as many nutrients to be applied to allow the, the crops to grow. So kind of going back to the older, more traditional vegetables and utilizing them. So not, not having an underutilized vegetable, in, in other words. So going back to that whole thing about would you put violets in your, or not violets, what am I trying to say? You know, the flowers that go in your salad. Anyway, going back to that idea, researchers also wanted to make sure that we're no, we don't want to come in and suggest that you start replanting the kinds of crops you've grown. We also need to make sure that there would be acceptance and buy-in and understanding and kind of getting behind that idea. So there was a lot of community-based work before I came in on this project at all around the idea of growing different crops, growing different vegetables. How do you cook them? How do you prepare them? Um, you know, fiddleheads were not very normal here until more recently, and then not everyone knows how to put a fiddlehead in a recipe and cook them and prepare them. So there were people who were working on preparing recipes for these former indigenous vegetables. Um, I had, when I, when I got there, and, and some of the women who also farm were saying to me, the kinds of things we've started growing are the things that you would find growing in the cracks of the, of the pavement and, and pull out as weeds, and now we're putting them into our fields and planting them. I mean, it's, okay. 
So understanding what impacts agricultural practices might have then on the local water quality, which hadn't been explored at all. So before I came in, the reintroduction of indigenous vegetables was well underway. There was a lot of work going on into, into um, these underutilized vegetables. But now, as the community was kind of behind this initiative, which was joint uh, collaboration between two universities in southwestern Nigeria and uh, a couple of universities in Canada, understand community perceptions around water quality as it related to agricultural practices, what the linkages between water quality and human health might be, enable local water monitoring and community health education, and better link food and water security, which oddly enough is not very well connected in many projects. Projects tend to focus on either water security or food security and not link the two. We had developed a, a kit called the Wet Pro Field Kit right here out of St. Mary's University. It's a water testing kit that um, we had developed specifically for community-based water monitoring. So the, the kind of QA, QC, quality assurance, quality control that would be at the level of what an expert scientist would use, and government scientist, let's say, but easy enough to use for an average citizen. So I like to use the analogy of you taking a St. John ambulance course, or you learn first aid. You are not replacing a paramedic. You're not replacing the doctor at the ER. But you have some skill that on the ground, if something happens to somebody, you can kind of be that first responder. The Wet Pro field kit was established so that if you go in your backyard, if you go to your well, if you go to your pond, and you wonder if this water quality has problems or not, it's, it's going to kind of give a diagnosis of, yeah, there's possibly a problem, or no, it looks like things are okay, but you don't stop there. You don't stop with the first aid on the sidewalk if someone has a heart attack, you call the paramedic and then you go to the hospital. And so the same idea here that giving an indicator absence or presence of a potential problem. Very easy to use, very straightforward. Um, we've used this now, this kit now in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, it's utilized by the government of the Gambia. So we're, we're pretty proud of this kit. Uh, it's used across Canada by the World Wildlife Fund uh, my former colleague has just taken one to British Columbia and Greenpeace is now <laughs> using the wet pro kit. Who knew? Anyway. I c discolored this photo on purpose. I think this is a sepia. So if you're sitting here, IDS students, there may be some, and thinking, why would she do that to Nigeria and put this coloration on the image? Because that just plays right into the perception. This was my perception of Lagos colorless, dreary, uh, underdeveloped, smoggy, dangerous, overcast, just, I had a lot of fear and negativity built in. I tell this story because anyone here is a student who's going to do field work, the story as it starts out turns out to be completely a different thing at the end of the day, as you can imagine. I was on an airplane with one other identifiable Westerner. In other words, one other light-skinned person. He was going to the Delta to work on an oil rig. He was wearing a cowboy hat and had all of the stereotypical, I'm going to work on an oil rig about him. <laughs> and I was thrilled that if any, either one of us was going to be kidnapped, and by the way, a British um, researcher had been kidnapped a week before, so give me some credit. I, there, there had been a little bit of context here. I thought, okay, well, well, between the two identifiable Westerners on this airplane, he's the more likely one to be kidnapped. So I'm good. <laughs> I'm safe. I can sneak out of the airport and he can, yeah, anyway. So here you are kind of coming out of Lagos, driving to the north. I'm going to jump around a little bit. Super excited. So this is me. I'm still in Lagos. So excited to get the GPS going. We've got tablets for nitrate, phosphate, the whole NPK to see whether the, the water is picking up on any fertilizers. We've got our data sheets there, notebooks, all excited, ready to go. Turn on the Garmin, 
mind you, I work with a lot of grad students and undergrads. They tend to be the ones who keep the data sheets. I oversee. <laughs> so now, and my students were worried about me. Are you sure you're going to be able to get the Garmin working, Kathy? I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> I got, I've got it. I'm trying to get a satellite. It's really overcast. I'm there in the, in the rainy period. Nothing. I'm starting to freak out because if I don't get the data, what do I have? So I'm there acquiring satellites. Finally, I give up. I pull out my iPhone. I send a text message to my grad student who's the one who works. <laughs> It says acquiring satellites, nothing's coming, I'm panicking. And he's replying and he says, oh my god, I'm in Canadian Tire on Quimpel Road, this is so cool, I'm talking to you in Nigeria. <laughs> I'm like, yes, okay, please, get me a saddle, figure out how I can... So he walked me through the steps and I was good to go. So we worked together, I, I met my Nigerian colleagues. I'm not going to go to this link here. I think I've talked about underutilized vegetables enough. Um, was keen to see the Canadian flag, of course. The Canadian International Development Agency no longer exists, but IDRC is heavily involved in this project. Um, and working with two universities, as I said. So the Nigeria Canada Underutilized Vegetables Project. This is what the landscape, once you get down with your feet on the ground, looks like. Not if I were to, to have no human being in this photo and say, where in the world might this be? You probably wouldn't say somewhere in the African continent, maybe. Um, very lush, tropical rainforest. Um, kind of a very interesting, lovely environment. This wasn't one of our sites. This was, again, getting, uh, this wasn't one of our sites with the community, just getting the, the equipment out. This was actually on campus. We were staying in student residence and I was looking for any moving body of water that I could find just to make sure that our equipment was working, that I could get it going. So if you're sitting here and, and you're a, a water scientist thinking, wow, that's not how you should put a probe in the water, um, don't, don't be too concerned. This is, um, yeah, just kind of testing things on the ground. The next thing that we Im immediately wanted to do was, and we took two wet pro kits to leave at the two universities we were working with was to work with their grad students. So these individuals are masters and PhD students. Teach them how to use the wet pro kit and teach them how to work with communities on the water monitoring and to not kind of put ourselves in the roles of the experts. Here we come with our suitcases to tell you that your water is horribly contaminated. I mean, it's very important to remove yourself when you're doing community-based work as much as possible from the here we are as the expert and rather th here we are to learn from you, engage with you, you tell us what you know, you tell us about your water, tell us about um, your vegetables. But before we went into the community we had both kind of a technical and a social science session with these students and these students are, are mostly um, hydrology students, chemistry students, biochemistry students, agricultural science, soil science students. They had been working on food security in these communities before. They knew the farmers well, they knew the, the women's associations well. So they had a, a lot of familiarity, more so than I did. Um, but just around the, the whole water monitoring and the sensitivity around water monitoring when you're going into a community that doesn't have alternatives. We've used the wet pro kit in schools in HRM. We have gone to elementary schools and tested water fountains where the water is high, has very high levels of lead. Gone immediately across the hall to the school principal and said, this water fountain has very high levels of lead. Your students should not be drinking this water. The principal can wrap it in caution tape, go to the store, buy a water um, cooler, bring it back, and immediately, right away, the students are no longer drinking it. In a community like this, you can't do that. Your well is your well, there is no other source. You can boil the water, but even to boil the water, you need to have firewood or fuel to boil the water. That costs money. So, I had conversations with women who had babies, and I said, for the most vulnerable people in your family, the littlest people, you should be boiling your water. 
And immediately that generated a very heated conversation around whether they could, in fact, do that. So this is the kind of context you're working in. So we had to be very, very sensitive and careful around saying, wow, look at the data. It shows your water is very highly contaminated. You can't talk like this. So finding language and ways to communicate the results and what to do. This was at my first day on a farmer's field. I showed up. And I was having a hard time understanding what I was looking at, because this is not, from a Canadian point of view, what a typical farmer's field looks like. You'll see the man in the, in the background um, almost waist deep, so uh, there are very different kinds of crops. To my back was a woman's home, her compound. She opened up her compound that would be our classroom. So uh, the first kind of day out in the field, we on this particular farm, we went to many, many different farms, but in this one community, to look at the setting from a hydrologist's brain, to look at where the water might be flowing, what the drainage might look like, where do they get their water. So in this community, in this culture, um, I'm just going to go back here for one second. This is another story. It, to get women to speak, they had to be separated from the men. So that was another thing that I wasn't particularly used to, that women were put to get, well, pulled together, men were separated. In the whole, in that community, in that context, in that culture, if the men and women were mixed, the women would defer to the men to speak, and they wouldn't say anything. So we had the women and the men separated, which again, from my background, was a very unusual experience to do. But it was, it was really great, because these women started telling me things that to this day were probably the most important lessons, I can honestly say this with absolute truth, the most important lessons I have learned through any of my degrees and in any other experiences I've had. And I'll tell you one of the stories that they taught me, the lessons that they taught me when I, when I show you the, these women. Just to kind of give you the, the general setting again, typical market side stall, stalls, um, Lots of produce, lots of, um, you know, kind of variety of things to purchase. I was referred to, and I've, again, I've traveled in many African countries, there is always a word, a local word for someone like me, which I always assumed was someone with light skin, until I took students from SMU who are Caribbean and said, I'm going to pass as African, and, I, and immediately were referred to by the terms that are given to me, and they're like, wait a second. It's person who comes from away, person who's obviously not from here. I was called it Oyingbo. Oyingbo, 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 Oyingbo was always ringing in my ears. It's very uncommon for an Oyingbo to show up in Ocean Province. So I was, I literally stopped traffic on one occasion when I got out of the car to buy something. And then people started to realize, OK, and a Yingbo is in town who is going to buy everything we have to sell. This lady has kind of a mischievous look on her face. Can you see what she has in her bucket? Neither could I, until I obviously had a curious look on my face, and she thought, here you go. <laughs> but the bucket was thrust very close in my face. Um, so the kind of food that is eaten and consumed, and the, I had never seen a snail so enormous in my life. <laughs> I didn't know they grew so huge. Anyway, um, so the, the kinds of scale of things that you see and that are normal, they, they boil these and put them into a very apparently delicious soup. So here we are, that field that I had shown you in a previous slide was right here. This is uh, a home. Their clothes are out to dry. You'll notice all women. Um, this is a, a female, obviously, professor from one of the universities. And we started talking to these women about the kinds of crops they grow. How do they feel about the whole indigenous underutilized vegetable project? Very positive things. They said that it's been great. They're learning to cook new recipes. They're growing new things. The food is very, they sensed that it was nutritious. They understood that. It was good for them. It was good for their children. It was enhancing food security. They, they got all that. But there was a lot of questions around water. 
I don't know if it was prompted by the fact that we were there to talk about the water or if it was there already. But they quickly started talking about where they used to get their water and where they were presently getting their water. So I was allowing them to, to kind of just flesh out these stories. And I think it was this lady right here, who find, in the pink shirt, who finally started pulling out these stories about the fact that a year or two previous, an, a company from another developed country, not Canada, had come into this community and recognized that uh, water was a problem, wells were a problem, coming from that whole stereotype of, you've heard these stories before, the poor woman has to put the jerry can on her head and walk four kilometers to get just a few liters of water, walk all the way home. She spends X amount of hours every day just to get water. So we've heard in many, many, many African countries, that story has been, and versions of it have been told and retold. So that was what was happening here. The women went some distance to get their water, which I thought was a little odd, why their wells were so far initially from the crops. But I thought, oh, okay, this is strategic because they traditionally might have known of contamination from the, the agricultural practices and so on. But then she started to say, I'll tell you a secret. And, her, and with the translator, I didn't speak the local language. That's how she started. I will fill you in on a secret. Of course, I'm immediately, I love secrets. Why, tell me, what's your secret? She said, we love that our well was two kilometers, in their case, away. We didn't want the foreign company to come in and put the borehole literally on our back doorstep. We enjoyed the two kilometer walk one way because we got to get away from our husbands. <laughs> we could <laughs> gossip. We could talk about them out of earshot, not worry about what we said. We could walk so slow through the forest, take our time, stay and chat a little longer, spend half the day, come back, and then say, oh my god, we had to collect water. Can you please take it? Can you do that? And so, and the women were all laughing. So it was like, okay, this story completely, I don't want to give the impression that it's unfortunate that in some African communities, women have to walk some distance. And so that her story is not everybody's story. Completely shifted my mindset in terms of making assumptions about things. The foreign company that had come in and built their borehole didn't ask them, where would you like your new borehole? They made a lot of assumptions. So again, this is community-based work asking, what would you like? What is your story? I'm not from Nigeria. This is the first time I've put my feet on, on this, this soil of your country. No way should I say that I'm an expert on anything here until I learn from you, hear from you. We spent a week hearing their stories, talking, asking, not making any assumptions about their knowledge between water quality and human health. We asked them what their perceptions were. I mean, if the water smelt good, tasted good, looked good, did they think it was good? And most said yes, but some said, no, you can have hidden things in the water just because it smells good and looks good and tastes good doesn't mean that it's good. So there was a mixture of understanding around water quality, a mixture of their understanding of the connection between um, agricultural practices and their water quality. One thing I am also immediately learned, though, was that there was a belief that maybe the chemicals and fertilizers that they applied to their soil could have impacts on their water, but they were very uncertain about those impacts. And if it was being impacted, they didn't know exactly what that would mean for their health and for the health of their children. So after we had learned their stories, after we had learned what they knew, after we had learned what their perceptions were, one thing that we said right off the bat was, it doesn't matter if what you're saying is absolutely true or not, it's what you perceive. If you perceive that something is bad, but it's actually good, well then you have to break apart that misconception around the perception. After the men and the women had talked to all of us, um, then we started targeting our education. What a great classroom this is. This is the kind of classroom that 
I work in regardless of where I find myself in a developing community. Flip charts, markers, and out in the field is fantastic. But we didn't start our educational kind of piece around, okay, page one, this is what we're gonna talk about. Well, because page one, they might already know. And there's nothing worse, in my mind, than someone coming from another country to say, here I am with my PhD to disperse all of my wealth of knowledge to you, and you're sitting there going, okay, well, you're not from here, and I don't know you, and you're obviously foreign, and everything you're telling me is really condescending because I already know that. I already know that I can get cholera from bad water, which they very much did. They knew a lot about, I can get, my children can get diarrhea from, can, wa from poor water. They know that. So why would we start from a point of what they know? We wanted to focus in on where the perceptions were a little bit off or where they were coming up with questions for us and saying, can you tell us and then fill in the blank. So we were looking at things like chronic effects and acute effects uh, of water, the obligatory group photo at the end, which ironically we had bags of what this, he's drinking water, he's enjoying his water. It's, a, it, it's called a nan, a bag of plastic baggie of water, which I thought was kind of funny that we're handing out water. Typical well, um, after we had done this project, then we started doing water testing. I quickly learned that once you start testing one woman's well, because the women call them their wells. Women collect water, they retrieve water, they're the stewards of the water, they do really interesting things like put their jerry can there, and then um, sometimes water or um, taps or wells are locked. So if it's shut off at a certain time, you put your jerry can there or your jug there, go home, cook breakfast. It's like l putting your, your sweater on a chair or putting your jacket down to, to queue up without having to stand there all day. And then kids do really, as kids are naughty and do these crazy things like shift the jerry cans around. So I, I learned all of these interesting stories around how women can start fighting over, the, my, who moved my can? I was in the front of the line, and no, you moved it to the back, and then the kids are like, yeah, we moved those around. And so you go to this one, you test this woman's well. The next woman says, no, you must test mine too. No, you must. You can't leave this community without everybody's well being tested. Wow, so we quickly came up with a strategy to have them bring their water to us, and we set up a, it was um, a couple of days I'll never forget for people to come and bring their water to us to test. And um, you'll see some of the images. We had to start finding activities for the kids to do because the lineups were so long and um, it, it was really humbling to see how needed and how um, much desire there was, to obviously, to have their, their water tested and understood keeping in mind that these wet pro kits were left there for local teams of um, graduate students to steward and be able to go into communities and answer questions for people. You don't get a sense of the heat and humidity and sense and all of that when you look at a slide sitting in the Burke Building in a relatively cool environment was about mid-40s on this particular day, and I couldn't take my eyes off of this fellow in his snowsuit, <laughs> who was probably so proud to be wearing such a suit, um, but all I could think was, why are you wearing a snowsuit? So the, the women, we, had, we didn't plan to do this, the women said, our children are our future, remember those age structure diagrams? You need to tell our kids what you're telling us. So when you came and did those flip charts out on our field, can you redo that for the kids? And look at these kids. This was a Saturday morning. Look at these I don't know any Canadian kids who would come <laughs> and sit and br and with their pens and paper. It, you know, a, prof a person who is a professor, it's just so gratifying to have this I mean, mind you, when you look at the, the group, most of the children were male, but... And then bringing their bottles of water. Okay, yes, scientists in the room. 
I don't know what was in these bottles of water before they were brought to us, but, but one woman came with her, she took a bottle of water, took a sample from her well and brought it. I don't know how contaminated or not that, wa that bottle was. So this is highly flawed methodology here, but keeping in mind, we were mostly looking for N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, to see whether um, there were fertilizers getting into their s soil, quite possibly. I had one woman come, literally, two bottles in each hand, and she went, like this. And I thought, geez, what's her problem? <laughs> and she kind of looked at me, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to sample those ones. She didn't say a word. I sampled them both. One was so clean, I wouldn't really hesitate to drink it myself. And by, I, by clean, I could talk more about the kind of indicators we were looking at. Dissolved oxygen, pH, turbidity, I mean, and then we were looking at, so I mean, I don't know things like arsenic content and lead. I wasn't getting down to that level. But for indicators, remember the whole paramedic versus you've got first aid kind of idea. From an indicator point of view, looked pretty good. The other bottle, when we put our tablets in to look at presence of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, off the chart, huge. So I went back to her and I said, where you got this sample? the one that had really high levels. You should be very cautious about drinking this water. This has problems. This one, no problems. It, not that I can see you, we should look a little more carefully, but if, you, if these are your two drinking water sources, I would highly recommend going to this one. Than the, so she went, oh, she wasn't happy. Guess what? The one that was highly contaminated, or more contaminated, was from where she walked two kilometers. And she was looking for a reason to tell her husband, I still need to keep walking two kilometers. <laughs> because this one, the, I don't trust that borehole. And it, I didn't provide her with that evidence that she was really hoping that she would get. I'll kind of start wrapping some of this up. I'm not even getting to the Gambia. This is another community, a different village, a different group of farmers, again, looking at their landscape. You drive through the, the countryside and you'll see things like buy your borehole water here, but most people can't afford that. Most people do not have it in their budget to buy water. In this case, um, we weren't in the field, they opened up the local church. <laughs> And so the lecture was in the, the, the church that day um, after we had done a similar study around perceptions and um, again, bringing their children was very important to them. And one of the things that we would find in showing people something like this is that it's highly visual. The water looks very clear until you mix it with a tablet that's going to give you the presence of uh, of nitrate in this case, you show it to the farmer whose well you got this from and his wife and say, this causes some concern. And they immediately start saying, okay, we need to do something about this. We need to better seal our wells. We need to either relocate our wells or make sure that they're capped better. And we're going to start doing some research and we're going to um, Nigerian professors, you're going to help us, right? You're going to talk to some engineering people at your campus and get them over here. We've done your vegetable project. Now please get some engineers over here to help us seal our wells because and conversations started around how much fertilizer is really needed in these soils because one of the things with indigenous and underutilized vegetables is that you don't need these huge volumes of chemical fertilizer. So a conversation started to proceed around that and then the farmers started saying, it's very frustrating for us because when we go to the market, the only thing that's available to us are these very high NPK ratio fertilizers. They are the chemi- and then they, this wasn't me lecturing to them, they were saying the um, fertilizer companies, the chemical co industry is trying to get our our soils addicted to these fertilizers and we have no alternatives. We either use it or we have nothing to use at all. So they themselves started looking at kind of 
the scenarios around what they could do. Okay, so that's the Nigeria story in a really quick nutshell. Um, I wanted to really briefly mention the Gambia as well. If we move up and around the Gulf of Guinea, over to the tiniest country on the African continent, this is where, this is kind of my home base for work that I do in West Africa. I split my time between Halifax and the Gambia. I take groups of students there, very passionate about communities in this very small country as I've come to, to be very close to a lot of people in this country. Um, as I said, it's the smallest country on the continent. It's 424 kilometers in length, follows the Gambia River. It's a tiny English-speaking sliver surrounded by Senegal, colonized by the British the smallest country because the British were only interested, um, there were no minerals, there was no gold, there was no, there were no elephant for ivory, there was no dime, there were no diamonds, but, they, but there were people. And they traveled the length of the river, exploiting um, human beings to, for the slave trade. And they wanted to be able to go, the river's very deep, very wide, and they could shoot a cannon only so far to the north and to the south to keep the French at bay. So the, the boundary of the country is basically cannon shot, north and on the south bank. S again, surrounded by Senegal, which is French speaking. So there you go, this is the, the context of the country uh, today. I could go on and on and on, where do I begin? I've got maybe five minutes to talk about this. Um, it's, a Sahel environment. So unlike Nigeria, which has this kind of lush tropical sort of rainforest, its arid aridity is a big issue. Desertification is increasingly becoming an issue. Deforestation is a big issue. Fru food security from a, a lack of moisture and available water is an issue. The rainfall in this country is becoming very unpredictable. It it's, uh, has a rainy season, so a seasonality to the precipitation. It's the dry season now. Typically, the dry season would last from now until June. And people are, have been traditionally so secure in their knowledge of the rainy season that elders will date themselves. So that when you ask, how old are you? Uh, an elder or an alcalo or a chief might say, I am 75 rainy seasons old. And now, as the rain patterns change and the uh, kind of traditional knowledge around when to plant your crops or your seeds for your gardens and your crops, it, it's kind of an unknown. People believe that precipitation has, is, is erratic and unpredictable and crazy. All right, so you'll see a very different kind of scenario and landscape here. We've done lots of water testing um, and set up hydrological stations now with the government of the Gambia, the Department of Water Resources. Again, this might look impressive, but it's 424 kilometers length in length. Um, the Dutch have paved a road on both the north bank and the south bank of the river, so it used to be, a decade ago when I started doing work here, um, kind of that on the red dust. <laughs> and in a vehicle that had no air conditioning, so you'd open all the windows to get a touch of air. We're right on the edge of the Sahara, literally, it's the Sahel. Um, and then by the time you get out of the vehicle, you have a thin film of red dust coating your entire body. Um, so used to be a lot harsher than it is now. You can go all the way to Koina, which is this spot right here, and uh, have a nearly paved road. So here we're looking at whether there's water security in the Gambia, which of course is linked to food security in terms of abundance. From a water quality point of view, we have done so much water quality monitoring in this country to find, it from a very, I'm very happy about this, that the groundwater um, is really, really of good quality in this country. So the, in terms of comparison to other places, um, Gambians don't use a lot of fertilizers. Do, there is very little industry, unless you have a well that's unfortunately sited too close to the coast and sea level rise and saltwater intrusion is an issue, or it's unfortunately located too close to a landfill. Otherwise, groundwater is very, uh, is very good quality, um, but quantity is an issue. The water table is, is decreasing, and so here we're more concerned with 
with water supply. I think I'm just going to actually not go into all of that, show you some of the pictures of what the landscape looks like. Here's a typical farmer's field in the Gambia. You'll see that it looks very different from the kind of landscape that we were working in in Nigeria. This is in the dry season. It does look quite different in the rainy season, but just this past rainy season, um, I was hearing from farmers who said that, and they, they will put all of their resources into their seeds. All their money will go to buying their seeds. And it's a bit of a gamble now. When do they plant them? So they'll plant them. The rain won't come. The rain won't come. The rain won't come. And then their seeds will be ruined. And then there is no money to buy more seeds. So this is, this is a very critical issue in terms of when do you plant your seeds connected to the reliability of the rainy season. And climate change is certainly um, linked to changing patterns of precipitation. Now this farmer is needing to use a generator to get water from his well. He has to pay for fuel to make that generator operate. So again, working very closely with the Gambian Department of Water Resources, uh, we're looking at real-time data. Now that farmer can't pick up this real-time data, um, but we have put um, cell phones into certain communities and I am really happy that, as far as Basse, we have a few communities that, as long as they are getting uh, an internet connection, and they do, they can actually look up and get this information and gather this data. And the youth are very literate in, in analyzing this and looking at this and working in partnership with a number of other organizations. And I've had a number of students who have done projects in the game, again, in this for the sake of time. Oh, that was the second last slide. I was, here we go. And we've looked at, at kind of getting a whole system in place where hydrological monitoring um, can enable people to better look at, at water security from a quantity perspective. This, the last slide, I figure if you can guess Gambian boys to stop their football game and be interested in water testing, then we've done something right in this community. So that's the last slide. Our next Gambian field course will be two years from now, so the year after next. And we take a dozen students there, and it's not a holiday. We actually do work there. Um, you have gone, so we have someone in the class who's been on that field course. So thank you guys for letting me tell you about some of the stories from this part of the world. Obviously, I love talking about it, so thank you for listening. It's really nice to share the stories about working with communities, supporting them with their water, and that foundation of that communication with these communities and sharing that research is very valuable. Thank you so much, Dr. Conrad. We have about five minutes. I know you guys want to take advantage, so please ask questions from the audience. Yeah. Is there a way they, wh where do they buy the seeds from? Is there a way they have a cooperative or something they could make their own, have their own seeds? Um, they do make their own seed. To be honest with you, I don't know a lot about their, the seed supply, unfortunately. I don't have detailed answers for that. But I do know, um, locally anyway, I don't know whether the larger scale farmer, this is very subsistence farming, they, unlike Nigeria, the the farmer that you saw, he will grow his crops, earn enough money for the small things that the family needs. Buy, he doesn't grow rice, um, other farmers will, but to buy his bags of rice and anything that's left over, they'll go to the market, sell their vegetables, and that money will go towards kids' school supplies and needs for children. So we were making a direct connection between what he was doing and kids not being able to go to school. It's literally that tight of close of a connection. If his crop fails, if he doesn't have the, his tomato plants and he can't sell them, he's not getting money to send. But in terms of the seeds themselves, I think it would be the smaller scale farmers maybe who would be collecting and gathering and growing, but um, most would be buying their seeds. You know, when I was talking with you um, and I was picking your brain, Wow, okay. Uh, I'm the kind of person who, I call my, I say I have academic um, 
deficit disorder, a different kind of ADD, because when you go into a community, and, and I initially, you know, it's hydrology, water quality, if, if people are not too interested in that topic, if it doesn't matter to them, you can really pick on and up on it pretty quickly. So I, I don't think I'll be continuing to do the work in Nigeria, but I'm still doing a lot of work in the Gambia and Senegal. And people have come to know me as a water person. They kind of say, okay, here, here comes the water person again, and come with the Department of, of Water Resources and their vehicle, and oh, they're here to test the water, and the water is okay. So what I started finding out about a couple of years ago, I, as I was trying to get youth engaged, you can see the soccer players, teaching them skills, because unemployment is a big, huge issue in this country, in this region. And so I was thinking, well, if I can get them learning skills, getting interest, maybe even in farming. Um, I've done a few small projects on beekeeping, getting kids made honey, and just because I feel that there's there's so much interest for the youth want to be active. They want. I mean, when I say youth, I'm talking about 18 and 19 year olds. They have nothing to do. They they have. So what's happening in the, in this region now is. When you see, so you're going to wonder where this, can, this story is now coming from. In the media, you see these boats of illegal immigrants um, going across the Mediterranean to Italy. Per capita, the largest percentage of those youth are coming from the Gambia. The population of the Gambia is only about 1.8 million. But those, so per capita, those boats are, are literally flooded with West Africans who are escaping a lack of opportunity in their country. Um, I just read yesterday that the goalkeeper for the female national soccer team died on the weekend trying to get from Libya to Italy crossing the Mediterranean. So that she wanted to play soccer so badly in Europe that she saw no hope for herself in her own country. And this is a country that I've been interacting with very intimately for a decade. So I'm I'm being pulled in a direction of the social science side of things that um, the Department of Education, actually because I work closely with them, came to me and said, your community-based stuff, do you think you could do something around, they call it the back way, this back way, illegal, illicit immigration. Could you do something around education with the back way? And my first reaction was, what? Illegal immigration? Um, but then I started thinking about it a bit more and we're in the first very preliminary days of looking at documenting perceptions. Again, it's, in some ways, there's some similar method to social science methodologies here. Documenting perceptions and thoughts and understanding. And as a geographer, do they know what route they take? I've been learning so much about, about this in the past few months. It's, it's horrific, fascinating, but horrible. And, and this kind of small scale of setting up entrepreneur centers for youth to learn skills and find hope so that they don't have to. Cross the Sahara Desert, it takes about two months. Some families are selling their farms to pay for their child to do this with all the hope that this is money in the bank, that this person, this child is going to get there and then help us out, get established and then send money home. Um, so they may literally sell their farm to enable a smuggler to get them across the Sahara. So about 60% don't even make it to Libya. Once they get to Libya, um, they may or may not make their way across the Mediterranean. Once they get in a boat or a dinghy or a plastic inflatable, they may not even make their way to Italy. And once they get to Italy, then what? So anyway. Thank you so much. It's very powerful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I'm enjoying the time that it's running out, yeah, and I like, sure. I wish we had more time to spend. Um, I talked to them. There'll be more opportunities. Uh, maybe we can. No, it's beautiful. Thank you.